Hello and welcome to another episode of Dinish Guarda City ABC Open Business Council series. We are here to celebrate uh, personalities that are changing the world, that are contributing to different areas from startups to innovation, but as well people that have strong, um, I would say, energies and strong uh, experience in terms of building ecosystems around the world but as well in terms of creating things and creating things that might be companies, might be organizations, might be products. So very excited to welcome to our series today, John Gale, someone that I, I know for a long time and that I respect a lot, that is based um, actually in Europe at the moment in Lisbon, but uh, that has a, a global network uh, all over the world. Most of his companies are between Silicon Valley, San Francisco, London and Europe. And uh, just as a small uh, preamble, because he has a fantastic career and achievements, I'll just highlight some of the things. So John Gale is the CEO of Carvalon Limited, that is a London-based company. He's an entrepreneur, uh, thought leader, and business and startup expert and global expert in the areas of innovation, startups, and uh, all the different areas around innovation, around business and the ecosystems. Um, has a proven track record in strategically identifying and penetrating markets and developing and enhancing client partners acquisition and relationships which are important and critical for business and for other kind of the different areas of technology and business. Um, John has been as well uh, based and special with Carvalon supporting high-tech startups and entrepreneurs and, and he has as well a big experience as an advisory and offering advisor service including corporate developing and commercialization. Uh, he has well behind has been as well behind the company Taligo um, in Silicon Valley since 1999, and he supports American startups and entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. Um, a couple of things that I think are interesting to look. So John has been on the board of multiple companies, and I think uh, one of them is IEE, that is the Constanza Network of Silicon Valley. Uh, is part board of directors of Silicon Valley Engineering Council and as well the Silicon Valley Association of Startup Entrepreneurs, uh, WorkIt, um, which is a very interesting organization. Is board director of emeritus of Silicon Valley Association of Startup um, Entrepreneurs and the COAD that was acquired by Macro Hill, or it was in the past, and a lot of other things on this area. In terms of um, a work that John does as thought leader, we have some of these lectures that have been done in the universities like uh, UCL Berkeley, San Jose State University, University of Texas, and of course, University Universidad Nova of Lisbon um, in areas especially related with entrepreneurship, startups, and business plans, which I think it's very important for anyone in the world. And one of the things that Sean has been in particularly involved is in writing or supporting white papers, like uh, startup presentations for angels, seed stage investors and partners, and equity planning, a white paper for associated and restructuring in early stage startups, and a lot of different things like um, corporate development, commercialization, market development. But John is, is, I think, a perfect personality for startups, but as well, it represents a lot of the acumen of Silicon Valley that at the moment is global, but at the same time, that still has a lot of, uh, um, I would say, the in innovation and as well the core um, I would say creativity that made Silicon Valley what it is today, the leading technology and business ecosystem in the planet. But at the same time, John has this bridge worldwide that is quite unique uh, from America to Europe, to U UK, to Portugal, but as well keeping a great network of people around the planet in Asia, Europe, US, Latin America and so forth. So John, welcome to our series. I could actually read a lot of other things from you. I want to just summarize some of these things and I'm particularly excited to have you here. Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, I appreciate all your kind words, and it's, it's great to see you again. I think we first met in the Red Lion Pub in London, God, must have been 10, 12 years ago. And uh, uh, I was just talking to the guy who introduced us a couple of days ago. So it, it's great to be back together with you. Now, my pleasure. So, John, I, I want to start, uh, I always like to go to the basis, I think, uh, and especially someone like you is particularly exciting because from... Um, a strong career in Silicon Valley, you've been actually navigating around the world and as well keeping a huge network and ecosystem that, that actually relates a lot of continents, a lot of countries, but as well you kept always a, a sense of cutting edge innovation, 
especially especially in the areas of entrepreneurship innovation so how that all started so can you get us a bit of your background education and overview okay sure uh so think of me as electrical engineer mba who started out uh as a project engineer then a manager of uh, manufacturing engineering in a magnetic materials plant and then i moved into account management and then district sales management in custom computer software with a uh, division of adp that was actually a startup that had just been acquired by adp and uh, then i became a director then a vice president in a merger and acquisition group that was part of international thompson now thompson reuters and that's where I got my first real exposure to startups. We acquired some uh, existing companies, but we also launched uh, a few startups and gave me my first uh, board experience uh, on startups. And so uh, I decided to become a consultant. And for a couple of years, I focused on the Fortune 500. But then I, I decided to go back into the area that's more fun, uh, working uh, with startups. So I've been working exclusively with startups as my clients or Actually, I co-founded a couple of startups. I was VP of BizDev of a couple of startups, but mostly a consultant to startups for the last, uh, I guess, 22 years. And uh, did that uh, to some extent on the East Coast of the United States. Then I moved to Silicon Valley and uh, then I moved to, uh, to Europe. So now my, my business uh, marketing is mostly based around Carvalon Limited of London, as you mentioned. But uh, this morning, for example, I was on the phone with some people who are launching a, uh, a startup uh, in uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. And uh, although COVID has obviously been a big tragedy, it's uh, caused people to be more willing to talk at distance. So I also closed some business in South Korea. And uh, a friend of mine in Bangalore introduced me to a startup in Los Angeles. So uh it's been an interesting trip around the world well, that's quite impressive because uh, normally a lot of people in silicon valley they stay in silicon valley and you've been actually having this global um uh well, network that is increasing and you kept moving with a dynamic that is quite uh, uh impressive to say less so one of the questions i have to you is so from your initial education um in the us and as well all the ecosystem of silicon valley you've been expanding Initially, always uh, incorporates, but then going to startups and and in, and um, at least the young, new companies. Let's put it that way. So, what kind of lessons do you would like to give us? Because you saw the industry going for the last 20, 30 years, and as well, you saw a lot of things changing. So, of course, things that would be like say, even just 10 years ago or 20 now are completely different because now we have the capacity to engage in. Most of the startups have uh, a lot of people from different countries, a lot of interaction, and that's normally what makes them successful. But from this kind of uh, element that what makes Silicon Valley so special, how do you see these changes, especially in the last three decades that you've been working, and as well some of the, I'm sure, the lessons that you learned during you know, this, these decades, working with different organizations, countries, and as well personalities and startups? Well, probably 15 years ago, one of the leading angel investors in Silicon Valley, uh, who is a guy who was making investments up to a million uh, uh, as an individual investment by himself in uh, uh, startups, said that he thought that the reason for success of Silicon Valley was because not of the concentration of venture capital, but because there were always uh, companies and startups who were laying off people and that caused a constant churn where talent would move back and forth between the big companies mm -hmm. and the startups and uh, do a, a nurturing of uh, all of the ecosystem uh, to be more successful. As I stand back and look at Silicon Valley and compare it to, you know, some of the other ecosystems around the world where I've... Uh, uh, done work, which would include uh, uh, Toronto and Mexico City and uh, Tokyo, uh, as well as several places in Europe. I think one of the interesting things is that in the Silicon Valley, there is a constant focus on the part of the startup CEOs uh, to be sure that both they and all of their officers are focusing on best practices to make sure that they're doing things in the best possible way. And while I see a lot of interest in the rest of the world in trying to learn from Silicon Valley, 
uh, I would say that that uh, really strong focus on best practices has not penetrated the rest of the world as much as I would expect it to. So I think one of the things we'll see over the next 10 years is more emphasis on that, because I think that's one of the key things that helps the uh, Silicon Valley startups be successful. And, and the, from your experience, uh, from your first corporations that you mentioned to your organizations creating your companies, what would be like the major achievements that you would like to share with your audience, especially in terms of career, but in terms of lessons, people that you've been working with, because you've been working with leading organizations in Silicon Valley, but as well worldwide. So just, I would like to share that because I think special people listening to us and in our podcast, we've been highlighting a lot of entrepreneurs, CEOs and startups. And I think this is probably one of the most important thing is personalities. Like you can help a startup make it or break it. And I think, uh, the concept of mentor, the concept of coaching, the concept of support is very, very dear in Silicon Valley um, ecosystem, but not so much in Europe. I think we're still discovering that. So I would like to just some of the highlights of your career in these different areas. Well, okay, thank you. I would say the uh, being promoted to vice president in that merger and acquisition group within International Thompson uh, was a key milestone for me and gave me uh, a different set of perspectives and all those different startup business plans that I had to look at was, was obviously a good background. You know, so I've now talked with thousands of startups and I've worked with, I don't know how many hundreds of startups and that uh, experience really starts to be useful. I think when you've, uh, when you've uh, met with maybe a thousand startups, I think you start to see things very differently than what you did when you've only met with say 50. Uh, so I, I would say that that's one interesting milestone. I, I think that getting to understand Silicon Valley and how it does things differently, uh, which, which took a few years for me to figure out, um, I, I think it was another interesting milestone. Being on the board of the Silicon mm. Valley Association of Startup Entrepreneurs that you mentioned in the Silicon Valley Engineering Council representing IEEE, the Santa Clara Valley section, which is the largest section within IEEE, which by the way is the largest professional society in the world. Uh, uh, the Silicon Valley Engineering Council represented about 50,000 professional engineers that work in the uh, Bay Area through their professional societies. And so that, that provided another interesting perspective. Um, as I've uh, migrated uh, towards Europe, I think that working with startups in various different uh, business cultures uh, helps you understand how things are different in different parts of the world and helps you understand how things have to be done somewhat differently. So, exa for example, lots of people respect the way Silicon Valley does things, but you can't do things exactly the Silicon Valley way. When you're in other places, you have to figure out how to apply the things that are most relevant. And, of course, uh, uh, another city in, uh, in some place far distance from Silicon Valley, like, let's say, Los Angeles, uh, shouldn't try to be another Silicon Valley. They should try to be what exploits their own uh, so their own strengths, uh, which are going to be in different sectors uh, than in, in Silicon Valley, for example. I, I've really enjoyed the uh, opportunity to be part of other organizations in different places. So, for example, um, I am now uh, one of the associates with the uh, group in the UK known as Boardroom Advisors, which is a group of about 100 consultants who focus on providing boardroom level advice to um, scale ups and SMEs, um, not just in the UK, but uh, throughout uh, uh, Europe and on an expanding basis. And that gives you another perspective of how things are done differently and how you can help structure and create opportunities for growth in, in different places. Uh, I've really enjoyed the white papers that I've written um, earlier in my career. I published you know, probably a dozen, uh, you know, three or 400 page market research reports. But I think that the white papers that I've written that you mentioned are really uh, perhaps more impactful on society because they're read by startup CEOs who are trying to figure out how to do things right. And so it's a way of me uh, sort of giving back to the community, uh, which is uh, very, you know, fun and useful, I think. 
So I, I want to touch this part that you mentioned, especially related with the, so one of the challenges with companies is really learning how to make a bridge uh, between the knowledge. And like you mentioned, if you are in Europe, you have to adapt to the nuances of Europe. If you are in the US, you have to adapt to US. And of course, the US is much more entrepreneurial than Europe and actually any place in the world, uh, with probably exception, probably some countries in Asia. So from this entrepreneurial DNA that Silicon Valley is, it's kind of, well, it's still the leader, I would say, in the US. Um, how we have seen the changes that are happening? Because of course, this entrepreneurial spirit that Silicon Valley managed to export to the world, especially the way to look at technology, to innovation, has been right now proliferating. But at the moment, we have uh, a lot of different velocities on this. So can you tell us a bit about you see these? Because I think this is probably the biggest thing right now happening, especially as technology becomes more advanced and everyone is a bit of a startup of me using the, 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 comp the, the title of the, uh, one of the books that is quite famous as well by Silicon Valley, Serial Entrepreneurs. Okay, so your, so your question is about the, the uh, assimilation of Silicon Valley type knowledge by a startup in other places. I, I'm, I want to focus on what the point you're trying to make here. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that. I feel let's start okay. with that. Sorry, my questions are all very broader. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try uh, to be great. more synthetic. Uh, I think that one of the things that uh, the unfortunate COVID tragedy has caused is that because more people are spending more time online, uh, that allows them to participate in events which used to be in-person events. So, for example, uh, the events in Silicon Valley, uh, uh, you know, were primarily in-person events in the past. But uh, during COVID, I was participating in a networking group organized by a guy named Chuck Goldstone in uh, Massachusetts. And through him, I met a consultant named Gil Perlberg uh, in Israel, who provides very interesting advice on how companies uh, should structure their management of intellectual property. And I think to me, what he had to say that was most interesting was how to address trade secret issues. Uh, and so I introduced him back to the IEEE Consultants Network of Silicon Valley and suggested that he became a member, which he did. And they immediately asked him to do a presentation on intellectual property. So sitting in Israel as a part of, you know, the remote world we were in, he was able to make uh, a presentation to their monthly meeting and, uh, you know, take questions and so forth as, as a part of the way that integrated. And so I see the tragedy of COVID as having provided a way for us to bridge uh, geographic gaps where it's now more possible to bring whatever expert is most appropriate to bear on whatever you need uh, to understand. And Gil just being one great example of uh, somebody who you know, can, has done that successfully. Uh, I think that there's been a lot published by uh, various books uh, you know, about Silicon Valley, but I think that perhaps more interesting to a lot of the startups is the incredible number of blog postings that are done by very interesting um, venture capitalists and incubators and so forth. So Y Combinator has published a whole host of interesting uh, sample documents and blog posts, uh, which are very helpful. And uh, the, the various uh, uh, prominent venture capitalists have done various other things and, uh, in terms of publishing uh, their blog posts. And, uh, you know, Jim Draper, who's, you know, an icon in Silicon Valley, has started an incubator network, which now has uh, facilities in several places in Europe and Asia, as, you know, he tries to strengthen ecosystems around the world. So, I think all of these make it easier for people in, shall we say, more remote ecosystems to not just 
acquire knowledge which comes out of Silicon Valley, but uh, acquire best practices that come out of anywhere because, uh, of course, there's very smart people in, you know, London, Berlin, Paris, um, you know, uh, Stockholm, uh, Lisbon, Bangalore, uh, Singapore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this makes it easier for them to all share that information and take advantage. Well, so, so I, I want to touch, um, so from your companies and the companies you created, let, let's look at a bit of your companies and ecosystem. Can you tell us a bit about uh, um, the companies you're running and some of the highlights and as well some of the organizations that you want uh, to present to our audience? Okay, so, uh, well, for example, I was a vice president of business development of a CRM analytics startup in um, Silicon Valley, which uh, was acquired a couple of times and it's now a subsidiary of LexisNexis. And uh, I am currently an advisor and uh, part-time officer uh, supporting a uh, robotic software startup, uh, Bridge Robotics, that serves helps the users of robots manage fleets of robot robots and uh, gather data about the status and what's going on with the robots doing things that the manufacturers haven't got yet got around to doing. Um, uh, so the, that last one I mentioned is through my uh, uh, English company, Carvalon Limited, uh, through my Portuguese company, I've helped uh, Portuguese companies relocate to various places in Northern Europe, uh, not just England, but other places as well. And uh, through my uh, Telego LLC in Cupertino, I've, uh, you know, while I was there in Silicon Valley, I provided support to uh, corporate strategic investors as well as startups and you know, since I've left, I used that as a consulting vehicle to work, for example, with that uh, Los Angeles company that I, uh, I mentioned to you uh, earlier. Um, so what I try to do essentially is to uh, project that I provide uh, advisory services, which are management focused and corporate development focused to startups primarily between the first seed round and the A round. And then uh, that evol can evolve into various other types of relationships depending on uh, what's important. So for example, this morning I was um, in a virtual meeting with three co-founders of a startup who are writing their business plan. And I basically was using one of my white papers to help them go through that process of preparing that. So they're going to work the three of them are going to work maybe half time for four weeks, and then we'll have a very interesting business plan to present to investors that uh, we've started to line up. I think this is the one of the key parts of your expertise is is guiding companies, startups, uh, and fast growing companies to to position themselves close to investors, to position themselves in terms of business development, and as well to have a solid. Uh, message with print and documentation so from your years of experience and as well from um, seeing companies that succeeded and big corporations that have been involved from silicon valley to others what would be let's say the the, the biggest uh, message or at least the the things that you pass for entrepreneurs listening to us um that that i, I think are struggling to understand these things well a lot of people live in their own mental box where it becomes difficult for them to think outside that box. And I think that uh, first time entrepreneurs who are just doing something and let's say they're only six months into it, um, have difficulty uh, thinking outside that box. And so for example, um, I had been a consultant for five years when one day I had an epiphany where I thought, okay, I thought I was pretty smart when I was that vice president of that merger and acquisition group within Thompson. But in fact, now that I've been outside for five years, I can see that I've finally ch evolved and changed so that I can think outside the box and be more creative about how to address whatever's happening. 
And so I, what I would suggest is that it's difficult for executives to uh, think about the following issue. They know some things that they know. They know some things that they don't know, but they don't know the things that they don't know. And one of the things that they likely don't know is how to think outside the box of their previous experience. You know, we're all victims of our, our history and our experience, and we uh, need to continue to grow in order to get past that. So there's a very interesting book that was written maybe 15 years ago where the title is, uh, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And the basic message is that the skill set that helped you achieve whatever you are at this stage of your career is not the same skill set that you need need in order to move on upward to the next stage of your career. And you have to figure out how to think outside that box, how to learn whatever you need to learn so that you can make that step upward. And uh, some people do that more naturally than others. I think that the people who've had more varied careers, like consultants, for example, and the people who have worked in uh, different countries, so they're exposed to different um, uh, business cultures find it more easily uh, to start thinking outside those boxes because to some extent they've been forced to by either that consulting career or by the uh, working in different countries because all of a sudden you're someplace where you know the people in this country think about things differently than you do and as you realize that you can step back and say, oh, okay, so they are seeing things differently, but that also means that I need to think about my history and how I should think about things differently. It's, it's a great way to advance. Yeah, I think this is the most important thing is how do you tailor your skills and your strengths towards building a business and towards the ecosystem that your business is part of? So, uh, John, from, um, from the companies, and, and I think, of course, when I talk about the companies, you have multiple companies that have been involved. You mentioned the white papers. So I want to touch, um, so for instance, um, in terms of uh, Carvelon, which is your main company, and as well, you have as well, um, your president as well of um, Taligo. So Carvelon is based in London. Taligo is based in Silicon Valley. And, um, and of course, you are a member of the board of multiple companies. Can you tell us a bit about this? I think it's particularly interesting for people listening to us, understanding someone like you, the way you coordinate your different multitasking capacities. But as well for, a, it, it's key as well for entrepreneurs and especially people listening to us that are in the wannabes or the ones that are already quite, quite but they want to learn more. How to, first of all, manage the skills that you touch but as well managing the network that you need to do between your companies and the other companies, and as well positions that can actually create other relationships. I want to touch this because I think this is something that I've been teaching in business schools that very few people speak about this. Um, and I, I know that you've been as well teaching in, or at least guest lecturing in some of these business schools. But I think, I know that the US prepares better people probably for this entrepreneurial spirit than Europe. Um, but as well, how do you manage these different things? Starting with you. Well, I try to maintain contacts with my international network so that I can be aware of how different people are thinking about different aspects of what's going on in different parts of the world. And that creates opportunities where I learn things that are interesting and where I can do things to help other people. So for example, um, uh, somebody that I've known for probably eight years, uh, we stumbled into a conversation uh, uh, a few days ago. And in this case, I won't tell you who he is because of uh, some aspects of what I'm about to tell you. Um, but he's a very successful uh, executive whose business model has been to go into startups after the B round. This is when uh, venture capitalists like to change the management if they think it needs to change. And so he goes into startups after the B round and manages uh, them through to the financial exit. And so that's been his business model for much less, you know, 15, 20 years. And he's been very successful at that. And in a conversation with him, uh, we stumbled into talking about uh, the boardroom advisor group that I mentioned to you. And he said, 
well, gee, that sounds very interesting. I'm more interested in board level participation now. Could you uh, introduce me to them? I, I said, sure, I'd be happy to do that. And since you're interested in that, I'll also introduce you to the Chairman's Network, which is another very similar network also based in the UK, which uh, helps people uh, network and find opportunities uh, at the board level. And so uh, I introduced him to the people who run both of those organizations. And uh, I think the opportunity to help your, your friends like that is really great because uh, it gives some benefit back to some other people. It gives them sort of a new window. And as they think about that, uh, you know, three years from now, he'll think of something that he can introduce me to or something he can tell me about that'll be useful. So I think that becomes a very interesting way to expand your knowledge and expand your contacts in a way that makes you more useful to your clients. Yeah, I think this is kind of uh, the holy grail, um, I think, in terms of business. So I, I want to touch this a bit more deep. So, John, so from, from this kind of what you mentioned, the exits, so every detail on the life of a company, and I think I love, uh, especially is one of the things I've been learning a lot with uh, actually coaches like you or, or mentors like you, because you need mentors, you need coaches, you need consultants to help you thrive and as well pass the different stage, but you need as well um, to manage the expectations. Um, so on this level of the expectations and as well, how do you engage with startups? And as well, how we would suggest, for instance, um, a startup listening to us approaching someone like you because I think this is very important as well to learn these details how do you approach how do you do the business how do you create the relationship because I think that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs um, don't learn and they have to learn through the, the or don't, are not taught let's put it that way and they have to learn with their experience or failures I would like just to have this because I think this is something that even me I do a lot of mistakes when I approach mentors or coaches or personalities that help me but as well when I, I have people coming to me, how to make the bridges and, and the different things. I would like to hear, especially with you and your career and the and knowledge on these areas, how do you would approach or how you like to be approached? Okay, well, thank you. But first, let me comment that uh, if there's anybody on uh, listening to this or watching this who, who isn't aware of your career as a serial entrepreneur, they really ought to go back and look at that because uh, you're somebody who has done so many different things with so many different startups uh, impacting so many different areas of the world that uh, you're extremely qualified to, to think about that same question that you just asked me. So I think that uh, perhaps the most, Im oh, you're welcome. You deserve that. So I think perhaps mo the most uh, important thing I've learned is that when I first meet a, a startup, I, I need to listen very carefully to what they're saying. Uh, you know, Mark Cuban from the Shark Tank in the United States made a very interesting comment in an interview uh, a couple of years ago. He said, I like to listen to the questions that those startup asks because from that I can determine how much work they've done and that has a great impact on how interested I am. And I, I totally uh, agree with Mark on that. You know, it, when you're talking to a startup for the first time, if their questions reflect that they have deep understanding about the area that they're asking about and they're trying to develop an even deeper understanding because they understand the importance of the issue, then that really makes the whole interaction very enjoyable because you, you know that it's going to be a worthwhile conversation where the person is paying attention to what you've got to offer and they're trying to figure out how to relate it to their particular circumstances. Whereas if they ask you a fairly shallow question, you, you end up wondering why they're doing that. I mean, if, if they're talking to somebody who knows a good bit more about entrepreneurial activities than they do, uh, why don't they want to ask something penetrating, which might even be a difficult question? I mean, I, to me, one of the interesting parts of interacting with a startup is when somebody asks you a difficult question where you have to stop and think. And, you know, that teaches you something. And of course, we always want to always keep on learning. Uh, and so I, I really enjoy those parts and I really enjoy interacting with uh, those entrepreneurs who are really focused on 
both being insightful on their own part, but in asking the difficult questions so that they can expand their knowledge base. And so I, I believe that listening is, you know, the most valuable skill one has. Yeah, very humble, but I think it's very important. I think, that, like you mentioned, I think the people with your experience are always learning and the same with me here. And I, I, one of the things I love is to learn with people, but as well understand it. Because for instance, even um, in every step of any career, you need always to, to go to the next step. And I think these steps is, it might be just calming down or it might be a fight with your board or it might be a problem with your clients or it might be more investment, which sometimes is a big challenge. But I think the challenge is that how you create a team of people that can help you and you activate these relationships that are really very powerful because in a, in a moment of um, pain or in a moment of challenge, it might be just that you have a fantastic client and you want to make do it right or you have a fantastic new product and you want to make sure that you do it right. But the complexity of business, and that touched me to a second part that I want to touch, is the complexity of business right now are increasingly um, becoming exponential because we have not only the human part of the business, there's the technology part of the business, there's the IP part of the business, there's the geopolitical part of the business, and it keeps going more and more. So I think being an entrepreneur right now is not an easy task as well because uh, you have to really be very, very connoisseur, connoisseur using the French word, but as well having a very strong resilience and persistence. So I would like to, because you have a really quite unique spot of both having the entrepreneurial base, the corporate base, the business developing base, but as well the technology base. So I want to see how do you see all these different things, especially bear in mind, for instance, you mentioned that you are involved in a CRM company, a robotics company. These are very different things that need different expertises and different um, as well ways of looking at it. Well, oh, back in the late 1980s, I realized that I had a skill of being quickly able to learn new technologies. And I've been able to do that over and over again. So that continues to be something that I do quite well. And that helps me bridge uh, the gaps between, say, the technical people and the business people because I've done that so many times and uh, because I'm used to learning about so many different technologies. So uh, it becomes, you know, relatively easier. Now, having said that, I know more about certain aspects of nanotechnology than others. I know more about certain types of medical devices than others. I know more about uh, certain types of, well, say SAS systems, for example, than some of the other uh, systems. But I've also had the opportunity to work extensively in the semiconductor space. So actually my, my hardware experience is more semiconductor related than, uh, shall we say, subsystem related. Uh, but I, I think that having done a, a wide range of different things uh, makes it easier for you to understand those different relationships you're talking about. And so, for example, when I first moved to Silicon Valley, um, the attitude of the people I met was, okay, so what is it that you do well? And they wanted to treat me as if I could only do one thing and they wanted to know what that was. And then after you demonstrate that you can do that successfully, then you get invited into lots of other spaces where you don't necessarily know anything about it, but uh, they want somebody who's reasonably uh, well-informed and reasonably smart to look at it. Uh, so for example, one of the startups that I work with, uh, I was an advisor to them and they were trying to hire a COO. And so the CEO asked his key uh, investor uh, what he would recommend. And the key investor said, uh, there's nobody around who's done exactly what your startup is doing before. So you can't hire somebody who's experienced at doing it. So what you do is get somebody who's been in a reasonably adjacent field and hire the smartest guy you can find and he'll figure it out. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, the larger ecosystems have been successful is because uh, the 
successful CEOs of startups are willing to hire people that are smarter than they are. So for example, Elon Musk said a few months ago that the very best uh, technical engineers, uh, the very best one was worth 100,000 of the average ones because he could really solve a whole series of problems that other people couldn't. And I think it's obvious that uh, people like uh, Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos are very comfortable hiring very smart people who may be smarter than they are. I think that's one of the reasons why they've been successful because they can delegate and the other guy can figure it out. Yeah, I think that's a, I interview actually one of my favorite interviews actually still in, we were going to be doing is a chairman of one of the biggest corporations in the planet. And uh, it was actually quite, uh, of course, the, the challenge, and I think this brings me to my next question is, so you were saying precisely what you said, is that they would del delegate and they would ask, make sure that people do the things. Um, but the thing is that that is easy to do if you have a big organization, if you're already big, but if you're a small startup that you have a limited budget, it's quite complex. And of course, in this case, it's one of the biggest tech companies in the planet that can afford <laughs> to hire the best people in the planet. So. From your experience working with both big uh, organizations, some of the top in the planet, as we mentioned, but as well startups, how do you make that bridge? Because at the end of the day, a challenge that you have is, is micromanage versus macro management, which is we're talking about, but as well, how do you delegate um, when a lot of things are still dependent of a, an infrastructure that is moving, especially for startup. And I want to touch this because I know that this is one of your areas of expertise is startups and, and especially um, in, in beginning companies. So I would touch this because I think this is probably one of the biggest challenge because a lot of companies fail because of the lack of capacity to make sure that the teams are flexible enough. And of course, with COVID-19, this becomes even more complex. So because we are working on distance, it's not possible even to manage the, the body language, the culture, it's different things, yeah. Well, I agree with you. I, I agree that you're touching on a very important issue. And I think that one of the problems that a lot of startups have is that um, one guy or maybe even two or three guys, uh, they'll start a startup and they'll get used to the idea that the CEO is doing sort of everything or that maybe the three co-founders are doing sort of everything. There's nobody to delegate to, so they have to do sort of everything. But as soon as they've got the resources around to hire a few people, they have to start delegating because if they don't delegate, it's just not going to work. So in particular, in the case of the CEO, if you find a CEO who's doing too many things himself, then uh, that startup is not going to be successful. He, he needs to be hiring people that he's comfortable delegating to. And uh, in terms of how he attracts those smart people at an early stage when he doesn't have a lot of money to pass around, he has to basically... Uh, convince them of the exciting nature of the vision for that startup such that that person who is very smart um, wants to be on board and wants to work for a, um, a modest or non-existent salary early on just to become a part of it and to, you know, get the equity position. So just as one example of that, um, Shortly after I moved to Europe, a friend of mine from Silicon Valley called me up and he said, I'm starting this startup. I'm inviting seven guys, including you, to be uh, the key people in that startup. And of course, uh, you have to be able to support yourself financially for the first three years because we don't want to take any money out of the relatively small amount that we're going to try to raise. And uh, I absolutely agreed with him that this was the way to be successful because uh, if you recruit the people who can be uh, financially independent for, say, three years while they build up uh, an asset in terms of what they accomplish for that startup, that works much better than if you have people who say, well, as soon as possible, I want to be pulling down 100000 or more uh, per year. I mean, uh, uh, early stage money is very expensive in terms of valuation, and you need to excite the job candidates to want to be there so that you can attract the good ones who are both smart and self-sufficient 
so that you don't have to worry about that. And if you can't attract those people, you're going to have a problem because, uh, for example, if you're a technical guy and you really need to attract a, uh, a good sales guy, you know, technical guys and sales guys have a history of having trouble uh, trusting each other. And the successful startup CEO needs to be able to not just uh, elicit the guy's trust, but to excite him about the vision so that he really wants to be there and wants to participate and, you know, understands that he's going to be empowered to go do a great job and uh, that it would be good if he did it as, as quickly as possible. Key, a key element and not an easy one. So um, we, we're passing the one hour time. So um, I want to just uh, two, la two or three last questions just to wrap up. So um, John, in terms of digital um, and in terms of uh, especially digital transformation. So you've been, of course, seeing all the different stages of development on technology. But at the moment, we are in a stage that is kind of digital is becoming the economy. Um, and we have all the waves of, of uh, uh, disruption that are coming out of digital from a data perspective, from an AI perspective, from a blockchain perspective, and as well even from a, a lot of other things that you're going to have like cybersecurity that are increasingly changing everything we do. So as someone that has been passing through all these waves, and we saw a lot of waves from the beginning of the internet to, to all the, the different things, how do you see this kind of uh, continuously disruption and as well acceleration of disruption, the Moore's Law a bit on this, but as well, what's your practical element on this? Because I know that you have, very, uh, you have a very strong approach about looking at things calmer and practical, which I think it's important for everyone. Mm. Oh, well, thank you. So let me set a little context. You know, around about 1981, the IBM PC came out, and that's what really accelerated the uh, usage of microcomputers across uh, businesses. And some people want to give the credit to um, the uh, Microsoft operating systems, but I think really um, the operating systems that came before Microsoft really laid the groundwork uh, so that uh, Microsoft could be successful. So this started in the 1980s and people were basically um, using it for, say, word processing and spreadsheets. And then in the 1990s, we had this big wave of what was called work process reengineering, where the major consulting companies sort of went through the, the big companies uh, and they helped them redesign the way they did their processes so that they could take advantage of all those computer uh, capabilities. And, you know, that had a very good uh, positive impact on productivity. And so now we're at a more sophisticated level where those basic transformational things have mostly been accomplished. And now we're uh, doing, uh, shall we say, more evolutionary things as opposed to, um, you know, basic transformations. And... Uh, so we have things like blockchain coming along, which I think will have a tremendous impact on the financial and banking communities. And we have artificial intelligence, which has started to have a tremendous impact. So across a whole series of industry sectors, we have a whole series of different technologies which are helping us to affect change. And so some people like to call this digital transformation. And if you go look at some companies that have done digital transformation, they make changes, but you know, then sometimes they have difficulty measuring the size of those change because they really haven't thought about how to manage that process properly. If they manage that process properly, I think they can measure the changes and, and really see some benefits and guide what they do to produce the most benefits. Now, the sort of uh, AI activities we see happen now are really focused in the big companies. So for example, uh, what I see happening is that the larger tech companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, are hiring a high percentage of the exciting AI PhDs as they come out of university and they'll work there for a few years and then maybe after five years of experience there, they'll then go get involved in a startup where they can do 
other you know interesting things so that means that the way that ai is flowing into industry is sort of via those large tech companies and the way that robotics are flowing into industry really seems to be by uh, the larger companies that can afford to make the uh, capital investment and uh, human commitments. But if you look across the rest of industry, there's a whole series of other uh, technologies which are gradually flowing across and increasing things. So I think that perhaps in the year 2030, we'll look back and say, well, we had this very interesting era of digital transformation, which started sometime in the mm, late 2000s and ran through sometime in, you know, the, you know, 2018, uh, excuse me, 2029, 20, you know, 2030, in order to roll out the next level. And you know, perhaps the really exciting part is, okay, after we finish that, what's the next level of change going to be? Because it's not going to stop then. We're going to continue going on. Things will, uh, people will continue to develop new technologies. They'll continue to find ways around Moore's law. And, you know, things will continue to be exciting as, as they evolve and change. And, uh, I think that good management, uh, Mackenzie has written a number of interesting articles on this subject. Um, good management is going to uh, take advantage of that and, you know, exploit those opportunities to be able to deliver more value to their customers and better working conditions to their employees. Two last questions. So one question is, so um, people like Mark, Mark Anderson, uh, they've been for decades as well, creating innovation, and right now actually there is behind actually Clubhouse, um, has been talking about the importance of making. And I think you touch in everything you're saying, the importance of doing it, the importance of making things happening. So I'll do so, and of course he wrote actually a book about the importance of making. And I think this is particularly important because, um, especially with AI, a lot of the things right now are starting to be automated. And people um, miscalculate the challenge between the, the, the kind of macro knowledge to the micro knowledge, but as well how to use platforms, how to use technologies, and as well to have the people skills that we're talking about here. So how do you wrap up all these different things as something that the startups have to right now to look, especially startups that are starting now, or at least startups that are fast growing companies? Well, one of the problems I've seen um, startups have for example um, let's say you've got startups which are serving the uh, manufacturing shop floor and they're selling to small manufacturing operations one of the problems i've seen them have is that the management of that small manufacturing operation will be in an age that's nearing retirement and they won't be prepared to accept different ways to doing things and so it gets very hard for the startup to sell in there. Now, typically what I've seen happen is that the startup gets in through talking to some uh, bright young MBA who's working in the place who may well be the son of the owner or daughter of the owner. And uh, that son or daughter thinks this is great. We can change the way we do things. But then the, uh, the owner isn't ready to make the changes. And so what happens is that the changes in that company don't get made until after the owner retires and lets the younger person, you know, take over. And of course, then you hope that the younger person, you know, uses good management strategies in terms of adapting these new things that they don't, you know, try to do too much too fast in a way that either you know, doesn't work or it causes employees to be upset or whatever. Uh, so I, I think that the management needs to be receptive to new ideas. And I think that those managers who are, are going to have more successful companies because they're going to exploit more of those new things. Whereas the people who aren't willing to change are, you know, going to relatively be left behind. And so, for example, some of the companies in Europe who've been successful in their own countries 
are reluctant to expand on a pan-European basis, whereas their competitors who are more interested in expanding on a pan-European basis are going to end up larger and more financially robust uh, as they move through that. So I think being open to new ideas and finding ways to try them that are relatively low risk is important. I mean, it doesn't have to be a major risk to try a new idea. You can find, a, in most cases, you can find a way to do that that's relatively low risk, where if it doesn't work, eh, you know, who cares? It wasn't exciting. Uh, whereas if it works, you can say, okay, it worked in that little place. Now let's rapidly expand this um, in a controlled manner so that we can make the business uh, evolve in, a, in an exciting way. Very positive and very inspirational. So one of my last questions, uh, probably the last one is so in terms of, uh, so that's a lot of, uh, I would say serious um, challenges in terms of the way the, the global society is going. So we have a very, uh, very kind of divide, divide, which is nothing new, but divide the geopolitics. And we have as well an acceleration of technology for levels never seen probably in history of mankind. And I think, uh, using the quote from Yuval Noah Harari, is that uh, we're going to see probably right now in the next five to 10 years, the acceleration of things like Ray Kurzweil singularity. We are going to have a lot of things that are coming actually from startups that some of them are starting right now that become unicorns and they've been working as well with fast growing high tech companies. So how do you see this kind of doom predictions and as well, the risks that are right now, especially coming from the corporate world, because for instance, a lot of the companies in Silicon Valley, and there's been a lot of criticism to that. They became so big that they swallow most of a lot of economies and they created the kind of a, um, I think it's like a virus. They, they destroy things around them instead of creating things around them. So of course I'm not uh, criticizing. I'm just looking at some of the facts that are really important for what is happening around the world and especially how entrepreneurs are shifting the world we live in. Because of course we have a, a few amount of companies that have a huge control of the world economy and all these companies were startups or actually were created as startups with some exceptions. So how do you see that, especially with your experience both in Silicon Valley, but as well worldwide? And as well as, a, as both a, a coach, mentor and strategist and writer, but as well as a, um, a business practical consultant that is trying to find always the, the opportunity within these challenges? Well, I think you're addressing a very important issue, which is also unfortunately very complex. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've read all the things about uh, the interactions between Congress and the major tech companies from Silicon Valley. And so I understand those, uh, those issues are happening, but I see those issues as not being so important from the startup space where, where I work. Um, there was a very interesting piece of market research done about, I guess now five years ago by Cisco, which they then gave away for free, uh, which was basically asking the C-suite of the Fortune 1000 worldwide, um, whether or not they thought that their market shares were going to be threatened by uh, startup uh, products startup based product uh, over the next 20 years. And the answer was that uh, those uh, gentlemen had a lot of concern about this. They saw this as a major problem. And uh, that report public uh, uh, ranked the different sectors in terms of where the uh, C-suite saw it as more or less of a risk and uh, the sorts of things they thought were going to be important. It was a very interesting uh, report. Um, sort of related to that, I had the opportunity over the last couple of years to, oh, I shouldn't say that, the most recent one of these was, I guess now a year and a half ago, and then the other one was a year before that. I had, to, had the opportunity to attend two workshops in London. In each case, it was organized by different organization, but it was about 30, 40 people where they were primarily VPs of product development from established corporations with, in each case, maybe five consultants like me uh, sitting in the audience. And in each case, 
after a few hours, I, uh, I stood up and I said, well, you know, what you are all saying reminds me of when I was getting my MBA. You're pursuing a very logical, methodical process to make decisions about how to implement new technology, you know, innovation, whatever you want to call it, in the products that your companies manufacture. But the problem I see is that it's taking you nine to 12 months to make a decision. And if I was talking to the startups that I work with, and if one of them were competing with one of you, I would say, well, you always need to respect the power of the installed base. You don't want to assume that you can uh, compete with a guy. But as a startup, we expect you to be making decisions quickly. And so in the course of nine or 12 months, uh, we're expecting you to make dozens of important decisions. And uh, if you and if you started with nothing uh, two years later, I think that you would be way ahead of what the established company was doing because the established company cannot be as agile. They cannot make decisions as fast. They have too many people involved in their decision process, which makes it very difficult for them to do things quickly. So I think that the predictions of that uh, Cisco funded market research, that there was going to be significant erosion of the market share of many large companies over the next 20 years due to the activities of uh, high tech startups. Uh, I think that's uh, very true. And I think it's a difficult problem for the innovation conscious executive in the established corporation to deal with because he's got to deal with his friend Jim or Sally who left their competitor and started a startup to do something whereas he stayed within the established company and he's trying to do perhaps the same thing that Sally's trying to do in the uh, uh, high-tech startup and all Sally has to do is keep the customers happy and uh, convince the investors that, you know, she's got a good team, she's got a good business plan, she's performing effectively, she's got customers who give good testimonials to the potential investor. That's all she's got to do. It's much less complex than what the person trying to do that in a large established company has to deal with. And so I see a continuing flow of new product offerings coming from uh, those startups to challenge the uh, the offerings of the large companies. And I think if we look at the banking industry, that, that's sort of a, a key place to look because we have all of the different blockchain things which uh, create one set of offerings. Then we've got the sort of new type of bank, which is sort of like a regular bank, only they're trying to be much more creative. They want to make it easier for people to get credit cards, for example, so they can reduce the number of people who are unbanked as, as you were involved in something like this a few years ago. And uh, we also have the other sorts of uh, startups like TransferWise, for example, which are helping people move money around uh, the world. And one of the nice things about TransferWise, and there's a number of other companies that also do this, is that if you've got a company, uh, you can uh, accept money uh, uh, payments by say wire transfer, for example. You can make payments by wire transfer. You can have debit cards. You can maintain balances. You can sort of do everything that your business bank account would do for you, except you can't borrow money from them. But in the case of a startup, they get their money from investors anyway. So, you know, they don't, you know, a bank's not going to loan money to a startup that doesn't, you know, fit their profile. Plus, there's this other type of activity, uh, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all of those other uh, hundreds of uh, cryptocurrencies which are looking at other aspects of the banking and financial community. You know, uh, I think it was Visa who just announced that they were going to start uh, accepting Bitcoin as uh, a currency. Uh, Elon Musk has announced that you can now use Bitcoin to pay for your t new Tesla, you know, when you want to buy it. So we have 
a whole series of different organizations uh, trying to take their little piece of profitable business away from the banks. And from a banking industry standpoint, I think that what this means that, okay, let's say there's a hundred different little types of pieces that these startups are chewing away at. And let's say that 30 of them are successful in the next, uh, you know, five years. I mean, transfer wise, you know, is obviously done very well so far. Um, Bitcoin seems to be doing well, et cetera. So I think what we're going to see is this is an, a key example of a change being forced on institutions that have been around for a long time, some of which do not want to change. And uh, as we had the consolidation in this area in the 2007, 2008 financial crisis, I think you're going to see more consolidation in this area as uh, these little companies take business away. Yeah, there will be, the disruption will be uh, keeping on going. And I think that's what makes it fun as well. And I think especially exciting. So John, for people listening to us here, where they can find you? I think, of course, uh, we're going to put links to all of that, but I think it's always good to hear it from you as well. Okay, well, thank you. So if uh, you can go to my website, which is Carverlon, C-A-R-V-E-R-L-O-N dot com, or you could go to my LinkedIn profile. And so you can search for John Gale and then toss in the word Carvalon or the word, word Telego, and you know that would get you there. And uh, uh, I have a I have a YouTube uh, channel, which is called Carverlon. And uh, those would probably be the easiest ways to find me. And of course, if they look at the things that you post, they'll find uh, several more. Fantastic. So we'll put all these links, of course, but it's good to hear it from you. So John, it's been a huge honor and pleasure. And I think uh, um, I, I salute your humility, but as well your pragmatic approach to these things, because of course your achievements are fantastic, but as well, I respect your continuous hard work in terms of keeping creating new things and as well expansion because you've been working more and more countries. So we'll put that as well in the bio and the information related that will come in the interview. Thank you so much for your time, John. Oh, well, uh, Dennis, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. And I would just offer to the listener that uh, uh, you've done 150 interviews like this. And uh, if they've enjoyed this one, they, they ought to be looking at some of the others and find out about all the other interesting things that you know, your, your guests have discussed. Thank you so much. Thank you, John.